2008, there was a young girl named Priya from a small village in Kerala. She was known for her kindness and innocence, living a simple life with her family. One fateful day, she went missing, and the community was left in shock. Days later, her body was discovered, mutilated beyond recognition. But this was just the beginning. What was uncovered next about the black magic rituals performed on her will truly haunt your dreams. Now imagine, this could happen anywhere, even in the most peaceful places. These terrifying acts are not just stories from faraway lands, they have occurred in communities just like yours. Hi guys, today, we delve into five real-life black magic murders that reveal the chilling truth about how deeply rooted superstitions and dark beliefs can drive people to commit the most horrifying acts imaginable. And guess what? These all events are real, and have actually happened to one of us. So let's begin the video. The village of Elunthor, nestled in the lush landscapes of Kerala, was a place where everyone knew each other. The villagers lived in harmony, their lives intertwined by years of shared experiences. Priya's family, like many others, relied on the local healer, Singh, who was known for his traditional healing practices. Singh was well-respected, often treating his patients for free, following in the footsteps of his father, who was also a famous healer. One fateful day, Priya vanished without a trace. Her family, frantic with worry, reported her missing to the police. The initial investigation yielded no results, and the villagers grew more anxious with each passing day. Union Minister V. Moraliteran later criticized the police for their delayed response, stating that a life could have been saved with a more serious investigation from the start. Days later, the unimaginable happened. Priya's body was found mutilated, her remains cut into 56 pieces. The discovery sent shockwaves through the village, and the once peaceful community was plunged into fear and chaos. The brutality of the crime was beyond anything they had ever seen. The police investigation revealed that Singh, the trusted healer, along with two accomplices, had performed the gruesome act as part of a black magic ritual aimed at gaining wealth and power. Singh and his accomplices lured their victims with promises of money and work in the film industry. Once they had their victims, they performed horrific rituals, believing that human sacrifices would bring them supernatural abilities and immense wealth. The rituals involved cannibalism and extreme mutilation, actions that were driven by their deep-rooted superstitions and dark beliefs. The village of Elunthor was left in a state of shock and disbelief. The community, which had trusted Singh, now faced the reality of his monstrous acts. Kerala's chief minister, Pinrai Vijayan, condemned the acts and called for society to come forward and identify such evil practices. He urged the public to bring these horrors to light and prevent further tragedies. The case sparked a political battle, with accusations flying between different parties. Union Minister V. Moraliteran accused the ruling Communist Party of India, Marxist, of a delayed response and possible connections to Singh. The ruling party denied these allegations. But the controversy added another layer of tension to an already horrifying situation. The Kerala human sacrifice case remains one of the most chilling examples of how deeply ingrained superstitions and dark beliefs can lead to unimaginable horrors. Priya's story is a tragic reminder of the dangers of blind faith and the evil that can lurk within seemingly ordinary people. As we reflect on these events, we must remember to question and challenge such practices to prevent more innocent lives from being lost to the darkness of black magic. But guys, it was just the beginning. Let's move forward to another incident that will literally shock you. In the rural outskirts of Medan, North Sumatra, Ahmad Siraji was a respected figure. He was known as a Dukuan a traditional healer who used ancient rituals and potions to cure ailments and solve problems. To the locals, Siraji's practices were part of their culture and tradition. Little did they know, behind his seemingly benign facade lurked a dark obsession. Ahmad Siraji was convinced that by killing women and drinking their saliva, he would gain extraordinary powers and become invincible. This belief stemmed from a dream in which his late father supposedly instructed him to murder 70 women and drink their saliva. This would, he believed, enhance his spiritual strength and ensure his success as a Dukuan. Over a period of 11 years, 
From 1986 to 1997, Siraji lured women to his sugar cane plantation with promises of spiritual guidance and healing. His victims, ranging in age from 11 to 39, were often desperate and seeking solutions to personal problems. Once they arrived, Siraji would bury them up to their waists in the ground, telling them it was part of the ritual. He would then strangle them, drink their saliva, and bury their bodies with their heads facing his house, believing this would strengthen his powers. The disappearance of Sri Kimala Dewey was the beginning of the end for Suraji. Her body was discovered in the plantation, leading to a police investigation that uncovered the horrifying extent of his crimes. Investigators found clothing and belongings of more than 20 missing women, and the shallow graves of his victims scattered across the plantation. Ahmad Suraji was arrested in April 1997. During interrogation, he confessed to killing 42 women, although the exact number of his victims remains uncertain, with some estimates suggesting it could be higher. Suraji's three wives, who were sisters, were also implicated in helping him dispose of the bodies. His cold and matter-of-fact confession shocked even the most seasoned investigators. Suraji was tried and convicted of 42 murders. Despite appeals and protests from human rights organizations like Amnesty International, he was sentenced to death. In 2008, Ahmad Siraji was executed by firing squad, bringing an end to one of Indonesia's most notorious killing sprees. His death, however, did little to erase the horror and pain he had inflicted on so many families. The legacy of Ahmad Siraji's crimes lingers in North Sumatra. His actions not only devastated the families of his victims, but also cast a long shadow over the community that once trusted him. The case remains a chilling reminder of how deeply held superstitions and dark beliefs can lead to unimaginable acts of violence. Ahmad Siraji's story is a terrifying example of how belief in black magic and the quest for power can drive someone to commit unspeakable acts. As we reflect on these events, we are reminded of the importance of questioning and challenging such dangerous beliefs. And guys, if you really want to get away, and away, from these kinds of black magic, then please make sure to subscribe to our channel as we will guide and upload the insightful knowledge that will protect you forever. Now let's move forward to the third story. Narki Novak was married to Ben Novak Jr., the heir to the Fontainebleau Hotel fortune. Ben was the epitome of success, living a life of opulence and luxury. But beneath the surface, their marriage was far from perfect. Narki, feeling overshadowed by Ben's success and constantly paranoid about his infidelities, harbored a growing resentment towards her husband. This resentment would eventually lead her down a path of unimaginable darkness. In July 2009, the Novaks were staying at the Hilton Rye Town Hotel in New York for a business trip. What seemed like a regular trip soon turned into a nightmare. On the morning of July 12, 2009, Ben Novak Jr. was found brutally murdered in their hotel suite. His body was discovered by hotel staff, and the scene was nothing short of horrifying. Ben had been bludgeoned to death with a dumbbell, his eyes were gouged out, and his body was covered in blood. The brutality of the crime shocked even the most experienced detectives. As the investigation unfolded, the true horror of the situation came to light. Narki Novak, along with her brother Cristobal Valiz, had orchestrated the murder in cold blood. Driven by greed and the desire to claim Ben's vast fortune, Narki and Cristobal hired hitmen to carry out the gruesome act. The details of the plan were chilling. Narki had unlocked the door to their suite to allow the hitmen in. She then watched as they carried out the brutal attack on her husband, ensuring that he would not survive. But the horror didn't end there. Investigators discovered that this wasn't the first time Narki had resorted to violence. Just three months before Ben's murder, Narki had orchestrated the murder of Ben's elderly mother, Bernice Novak. Bernice was found dead in her home in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, initially thought to be an accidental fall. However, it was later revealed that she had been beaten to death. Narki's motive was clear. Eliminate anyone who stood between her and the family fortune. The trial of Narki Novak was a spectacle, revealing the depths of her greed and cruelty. Testimonies from accomplices and evidence presented in court painted a picture of a woman consumed by the desire for wealth and power. 
Narki showed no remorse for her actions, maintaining her innocence despite the overwhelming evidence against her. The jury found her guilty of orchestrating both murders, and she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The Narki Novak case is a haunting reminder of the lengths to which people will go for money and power. The brutality of the murders, combined with the betrayal of trust, makes this one of the most chilling cases in recent history. Narki's actions not only led to the gruesome deaths of her husband and mother-in-law, but also left a lasting scar on those who knew the Novak family. As we reflect on this case, we are reminded of the dangers of unchecked greed and the darkness that can reside within the human soul. The Narki Novak case will forever be a tale of horror and betrayal, a story that will haunt your dreams and make you question the true nature of those around you. The Fall River Cult Murders, Massachusetts In the late 1970s, the small city of Fall River, Massachusetts, became the backdrop for a series of gruesome murders that would forever haunt its history. This story is one of dark rituals, unspeakable violence, and a cult that believed they were invoking the powers of Satan. It all began in October 1979, when the body of 17-year-old Doreen Levesque was discovered under the bleachers of a local high school. She had been brutally beaten and sexually assaulted. The horrific nature of her death shocked the community and marked the start of a series of events that would plunge Fall River into a state of fear and panic. A few months later, in November 1979, Barbara Raposa, a 19-year-old single mother, went missing. Her body was found in January 1980, abandoned in a remote wooded area. Like Doreen, Barbara had been subjected to extreme violence. The community was now gripped by fear, rumors of satanic rituals and cult activities spreading like wildfire. The final victim was 20-year-old Karen Marsden. In February 1980, Karen went missing under mysterious circumstances. Her partial remains were discovered in April of that year, revealing a level of brutality that was unimaginable. Witnesses later testified that Karen had been a reluctant participant in the cult's activities and knew too much about the previous murders. Her death was marked by ritualistic mutilation, and it was said that her head was removed and used in a satanic ceremony. The leader of this cult was Carl Drew, a man deeply immersed in the local underworld of sex work and drugs. He convinced his followers, including Robin Murphy and others, that their acts of violence were sacrifices to Satan, promising them power and control. Robin Murphy, who later testified against Drew, described the terrifying rituals and the brutal murders in chilling detail. She admitted to participating in the killings under Drew's direction, driven by fear and a twisted sense of loyalty to the cult. The investigation into these murders was complex and fraught with challenges. There were conflicting testimonies, and the dark nature of the crimes made it difficult to separate fact from fiction. However, the authorities eventually managed to gather enough evidence to convict Carl Drew and Robin Murphy. Drew was sentenced to life in prison without parole, while Murphy, who struck a deal for her testimony, also received a life sentence but with the possibility of parole. The Fall River cult murders remain a haunting reminder of how deeply human beings can be influenced by dark beliefs and the extent of violence that can be perpetrated under the guise of religious fanaticism. The story is a stark warning of the dangers of unchecked power and the terrifying outcomes of cult-like mentalities. As we reflect on these events, we are reminded of the importance of vigilance and the need to question and challenge such dangerous ideologies. The Fall River cult murders will forever be etched in the annals of criminal history, a chilling tale of how darkness can engulf a community and lead to unimaginable horrors. Now, let's move forward to the fifth story. In the early 20th century, the peaceful communities along the Southern Pacific Railroad line in Louisiana and Texas were shattered by a series of brutal murders that became known as the Louisiana Voodoo Murders. These horrific crimes, spanning from 1911 to 1912, were attributed to a young woman named Clementine Barnabet, who claimed to have killed as many as 35 people under the influence of a voodoo cult. Clementine Barnabet was born around 1894, in St. Martinville, Louisiana. She grew up in a troubled household, with her father, Raymond Barnabet, being a known petty criminal and a violent man. By 1911, 
The Barnabet family had moved to Lafayette, Louisiana, where a wave of gruesome axe murders began to terrorize the region. Entire families were found slaughtered in their homes, their skulls split open by an axe, often while they slept. The brutality of these murders was unparalleled, with blood-soaked scenes and bodies positioned in ritualistic manners, leading to widespread panic and fear. The first major break in the case came when Raymond Barnabet was arrested for the murder of the Andrus family. During his trial, Clementine and her brother Zephyrin testified against their father, claiming he returned home covered in blood and boasted about the killings. Despite this testimony, the murders continued even while Raymond was in custody, casting doubt on his sole involvement. Suspicion soon fell on Clementine herself. In November 1911, she was arrested after blood was found on clothes in her room and on the door latch of her house. During her interrogation, Clementine confessed to the murders, claiming she was part of a cult called the Church of Sacrifice. She described how she and her accomplices would draw lots to decide who would commit the murders, believing that the sacrifices would grant them supernatural protection and power. Her confessions, however, were inconsistent and often contradicted earlier statements, leading some to question her reliability and mental state. The killings reached a horrifying climax in January 1912, when the Broussard family was found murdered in their home in Lake Charles, Louisiana. The scene was marked by a message scrawled on the wall, which was interpreted as a ritualistic symbol, further, fueling the belief in the cult's involvement. Newspapers sensationalized the story, linking the murders to voodoo practices and spreading fear throughout the region, at at. Clementine's trial was a spectacle, with her detailed and gruesome confessions capturing the public's morbid fascination. She was eventually convicted and sentenced to life in prison. However, doubts about her involvement persisted, with modern analysts suggesting that some of the murders might have been the work of other individuals or even copycat killers. Despite her conviction, Clementine was released from prison in 1923 after undergoing a mysterious surgical procedure that authorities believed had cured her. The Louisiana voodoo murders remain one of the most disturbing and enigmatic crime sprees in American history. They are a chilling reminder of how fear and superstition can intertwine, leading to acts of unimaginable horror. As we delve into these dark stories, we are reminded of the importance of seeking truth and justice amidst the shadows of fear and myth. We hope that these stories not only inform but also caution against the dangers of unchecked beliefs and the evil that can emerge from them. If you found this journey through history's most chilling tales compelling, make sure to subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll gain access to more in-depth explorations of true crime, mysteries, and dark historical events. Stay informed, stay safe, and join us as we continue to uncover the shadows of the past. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss a new story. Until next time, stay vigilant and keep questioning.